Michael, thanks, very much, uh, thanks very much, Bob. I, I greatly appreciate being here. Patrick, thank you for inviting me again. And I, I hope next time we will be meeting in person. Um, I have a mixed, I think like, like all our speakers, there, there's been some progress, but also some frustrations with our ability to really achieve viral hepatitis elimination by 2030. Uh, here are my disclosures. <clears throat> I think we all recognize uh, that there are five key interventions to reach uh, HCV elimination. Uh, of course, hepatitis C treatment is important. We've made uh, great strides with the medications that we have now that are uh, very easily uh, utilized by many different types of healthcare providers and are incredibly effective. Uh, HCV testing, of course, trying to identify all the individuals who have hepatitis C who could benefit from therapy, uh, harm reduction, uh, working on blood safety and injection safety uh, around the world would have major impact in our ability to ultimately eliminate a viral hepatitis. Uh, you'll see what our baseline coverage is in the dark green here from 2015 and our coverage targets in 2030. And uh, unfortunately, we, yes, we've made some progress over the last five years, but achieving the, the goals here are still somewhat elusive uh, uh, in the United States as well. I think this year uh, saw some very important uh, policy recommendations that will go a long way to our ability to, uh, uh, to continue towards our goal of viral hepatitis elimination by 2030. Uh, the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, which is a, a very influential body in the United States, uh, whereby uh, their recommendations are uh, very measured and often uh, difficult to uh, things. Uh, what I would say is that things that seem very obvious to us are often uh, more difficult to move forward into a policy recommendation. Uh, they embraced screening uh, all adults for hepatitis C. Uh, on a one-time basis. So all asymptomatic adults between the ages of 18 to 79 without any known liver disease and periodically screen persons with continued risk for hepatitis C infection. These are now uh, widely accepted uh, recommendations by this influential body that often uh, is, is the uh, policy recommendations that are adopted by our primary care physicians who are often in the front lines of first identifying patients with hepatitis C. So I think this was one major, very optimistic and very important breakthrough. Of course, the CDC has always been a, a leader in uh, the, the, the fight against viral hepatitis and their recommendations are shown here. Uh, also con uh, consistent with the US PSTF, hepatitis C screening at least once for all adults aged over 18, uh, hepatitis C screening for all pregnant women. Uh, <clears throat> uh, they did put some qualifiers in here, which I think uh, can be a little bit confusing and I think we're not ne really necessary uh, within the United States itself. We shouldn't be really uh, necessarily worrying about these, these uh, prevalence settings. Uh, persons who uh, one time testing for hepatitis C, classically for persons with rec recognized risk factors, of course, routine testing for ongoing risk, so people who continue to inject drugs, for example. Uh, persons with underlying medical conditions and, and any person who wants to be tested for hepatitis C. So uh, if we adopt all of these recommendations, I think that we, that our primary care colleagues and even our specialty colleagues who are seeing patients in various settings for other unrelated conditions, uh, it's easy if they're drawing blood, for example, easy enough to, uh, to uh, try to adopt these recommendations and get as many people screened for hepatitis C as possible. <clears throat> So that's, that's the good news. The bad news, of course, is that we're, we're still behind in our ability to test. We still estimate that a relatively low percentage, uh, maybe 50%, maybe a little bit better now, are of patients who are infected with hepatitis C are aware of their infection. Uh, we know that people who are undiagnosed miss the tremendous benefits of hepatitis C therapy. Uh, for example, a major reduction in liver-related mortality. Uh, we know that there's increasing burden of hepatitis C, uh, and that's due to the uh, opiate epidemic and increasing injection drug use, particularly among younger age groups. And as you see here on this slide, the rates of reported acute hepatitis C, which is very underestimated by at least uh, tenfold, uh, you'll see has increased from 2011 through 2017 and, and continues to increase. Uh, and, uh, and you see the differences in age here. And uh, again, 
in my practice, we're seeing many more younger people uh, than we've ever seen before under the age of uh, say 35 and even under the age of 30 who are coming to us with chronic hepatitis C infection as a result of uh, injecting drug use. So <clears throat> I think that uh, identifying people, of course, is particularly important for viral hepatitis elimination. Now, there, there are some bright spots. Uh, we see that there are some uh, uh, We do see that there are some changes to the uh, prevalence of, of hepatitis C uh, infection here in the United States. Uh, some of this is uh, good news related to, um, you know, the cure of hepatitis C infection. There also are some changes related to the uh, methodologies that are being used, um, as well as <clears throat> some, unfortunately, some patients, of course, who have had advanced liver disease and ultimately succumbed to uh, complications of, of, uh, of hepatitis C. But overall, we're already starting to see a decrease in the mortality rate. And some of this, a, a large portion, but perhaps not as great as we had hoped, uh, due to the access of hepatitis C therapies is related to, of course, the availability of, of these treatments. Clearly, that's also having a major impact. But again, if half the patients are not recognizing that they have hepatitis C infection, we still have a long way to go. Uh, in this regard. Uh, testing again has been uh, helped with, with a number of these. One, the policy recommendations, recommendations that I mentioned. There are also, uh, in the United States, there are several different uh, electronic health record systems that are utilized by most of the major uh, medical systems here and trying to uh, utilize reminders for the clinicians to test patients as part of their routine care to uh, generate uh, automated, orders, automated order sets, for example, uh, to educate clinicians in this regard, to provide feedback on how well they're doing in testing patients who should be tested for hepatitis C uh, is um, very critical to improving our ability to test, identify patients, get them treated, and then again, working towards this goal of, of elimination. Patients themselves also need help navigating the system. The, 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 the system can be complex linking people to care even after they've been identified, uh, getting, they, getting them channeled into appropriate providers who can treat hepatitis C still remain uh, a challenge for many patients. And accessibility of hepatitis C therapy, fortunately that has greatly improved over the last several years. It was very restrictive across most of the states in the US based on uh, fibrosis restrictions, uh, limiting treatment to advanced fibrosis. Now that has been greatly expanded. The restrictions have been loosened tremendously so that I think overall accessibility to treatments in the United States is much better than it was last year when we talked about this. <clears throat> I showed before that the, uh, the one of the biggest increases, probably the biggest increase in the new cases of hepatitis C are among persons who inject drugs and um, accounting for about 75% of new injections. You'll see that uh, there are areas around the U.S. where this is uh, uh, much more of a problem. In North Carolina, even within the uh, areas within the coast and areas within the mountains, are have a much higher incidence of acute hepatitis C infection than other parts of North Carolina. So there's a difference in geographic distribution as well, even within uh, the various states. So there are priorities to try to work towards viral hepatitis elimination, of course, accessing harm reduction therapies. Uh, still very controversial here uh, in many areas of, of the United States. The number of needles uh, uh, and syringes that are provided for each person who inject drugs is much lower than uh, the target, as, as you can see here. Uh, we see that access to hepatitis C testing among per persons who inject drugs uh, is still low. It's estimated that only about 30% of drug treatment facilities offer hepatitis C uh, testing capabilities. and um, the good news is that if you do get these patients into treatment, they do quite well. Uh, multiple studies have demonstrated that cure rates for active injecting drug users are no, uh, no worse than 88%. Uh, and some have shown much higher, particularly when they uh, utilize navigators and the treatments are associated with uh, injecting drug treatment facilities, for example. And there's also a low risk of reinfection. That's one of the, uh, one of the uh, 
uh, concerns that people had about treating active injecting drug users. And uh, fortunately, multiple studies have demonstrated that the, the risk of reinfection is relatively low. So I think that focusing on this group of individuals is going to be critically important uh, as we move forward, as, as we continue to, to work towards that goal. So are we there yet? Uh, of course, the answer is no. Uh, the United States uh, issued their first uh, national strategic plan around 2015. They have just updated this in 2021, uh, laid out the ground rules for the next five years, and the goals are shown here. Well, the vision is for the U.S. to be a place, as you can see here, where new viral hepatitis infections are prevented. Every person knows their status, and every person with viral hepatitis has high quality health care and uh, uh, available treatment and can live free from stigma and, dis and uh, discrimination. Those are a very, a very worthwhile and important vision, and I think we all we all can embrace. The goals over the next five years are to try to prevent new viral hepatitis infections through some of the things I mentioned, improve viral hepatitis related health outcomes uh, of people with viral hepatitis, um, particularly by uh, allowing them uh, good access to care and treatment, reduce viral hepatitis related disparities and health uh, uh, health inequities. We recognize that treatments are not universally available, uh, for, particularly for people who have no health insurance. They may have more problems if they fall into uh, certain uh, gray areas. They don't qualify for government assistance, but they don't have enough income or they're unemployed to be able to qualify for a, um, an employer benefit plan, for example. Uh, improve viral hepatitis surveillance and data usage, which of course goes a long way to understanding where the gaps are and our ability to eliminate viral hepatitis and continue to work to achieve integrated coordinated efforts across uh, to address this viral hepatitis epidemic across all the different partners and stakeholders. And in the United States with 50 states, multiple territories, uh, different uh, stakeholders, uh, this does become particularly challenging trying to coordinate this, but at least this roadmap uh, gives us some additional hope uh, in this regard. So thank you very much. And I'd just like to thank uh, John Ward for uh, a lot of the work that he's doing with the um, Coalition for Global Hepatitis Elimination and the slides that he allowed me to use uh, for this talk. Uh, he's working closely with the AASLD uh, Viral Hepatitis Elimination Task Force, which he also chairs. So thank you very much.